The year is 678 AD. The heart of civilization, Constantinople, stands beleaguered. For months, the Byzantine Empire, the continuation of the Roman legacy in the East and the keeper of its greatest secrets, has endured the relentless siege by the Umayyad Caliphate. History, in its neat, simplified chapters, tells us this was a clash of titans, a strategic masterpiece where superior fortifications, the legendary Theodosian walls, and a massive defensive chain across the Golden Horn proved to be the decisive factors. The conventional narrative is a fortress built on dry facts. Emperor Constantine IV's tenacity, the logistic nightmare for the invaders, the sheer unyielding strength of stone against steel. This is the comfort of accepted history. It allows us to process the fall and rise of empires through quantifiable military power. We are taught that the outcome was inevitable, a victory of Byzantine resilience against Arab expansion. But this narrative is incomplete. It's too clean, too easily explained. The historical record is a decoy. It distracts us from the one definitive element that should have been impossible to create. What if the key to that survival was a weapon so radical, so terrifying, it violated the very physics of warfare? The Arab fleet, vast and confident, sailed into the Propontis, ready to deliver the fatal blow. They were prepared for Greek fire, for oil-soaked arrows and conventional siege weapons. They were prepared for war. But they were not prepared for the impossible. They were not prepared for the fire that history tried to forget. This fire was not a tool of war. It was an act of alchemy. Its existence shattered the logical progression of technological development, creating a historical anachronism. For a brief, crucial period, the Byzantines possessed a secret that made their small fleet invincible. It gave them a technological edge so profound that it rewrote the political geography of the world. And yet, this secret did not evolve. It did not spread. It simply vanished. This is where the official history dissolves into legend and where the glitch begins. The moment of impact. The Arab sailors, hardened veterans of naval conflict, witness a sight that paralyzes them with a fear colder than the Aegean Sea. From the bow of a Byzantine Droman, the primary warship of the fleet, designed to carry the terrifying projecting device, a thick, viscous stream of liquid is propelled through the air. It issues from a bronze tube, the siphon, accompanied by a horrifying pressurized hiss, like a dragon drawing breath. When the liquid hits the wooden hull of an enemy ship, it erupts, instantly. A column of searing white-hot flame, intense and utterly consuming. But the true horror is yet to come. The Arabian sailors instinctively plunged into the waves to quench the inferno. They try to capsize the burning vessels, forcing the fire under the waves. But here the water failed them. The fire pursued. The fire devoured the sea. This is the core paradox. Greek fire violates the elemental laws of chemistry known to the ancient world and almost every compound we can reconstruct today. We must clarify, water was not the fuel. Water was the trigger. The reaction with water generated the cataclysmic heat that ignited the petroleum compounds. To the enemy, the distinction was irrelevant. The flames, known to the Byzantines as sea fire or liquid fire, not only resist the water, they seem to feed on it, spreading along the surface of the sea. Men jump overboard to escape the heat and the smoke, only to find the unholy substance clinging to their wet clothes, burning their skin even beneath the waves. We are forced to ask, what compound possesses such a terrifying property that could have been available in the 7th century AD? The formula was the most closely guarded secret of the Byzantine state, attributed originally to a Jewish architect from Heliopolis named Kalinikos. It was a state monopoly, never written down, 
passed only through a handful of trusted officials and engineers. The weapon's secrecy was its strength, but also the reason for its ultimate disappearance. Its existence is the glitch in our linear understanding of scientific history. Since its use faded in the 13th century, scholars have desperately attempted to recreate the glitch. The pursuit has created a dizzying array of competing hypotheses, each seeking to explain the water-resistant inferno. Hypothesis A, crude napalm. This is the simplest theory. Greek fire was a mixture of refined crude oil, resin, and pitch. These ingredients are highly flammable and sticky. The glitch. While this would be hard to extinguish, water would still eventually quench it. It does not fully explain the accounts of the fire actively feeding on water. The logic is too weak for the terror described. Hypothesis B, quicklime, calcium oxide, the strongest contender. Quicklime is a simple chemical compound that reacts violently with water, generating enough heat to ignite other combustible materials in the mixture, such as sulfur or petroleum. The glitch. The reaction creates steam and heat, but quicklime alone is not enough to maintain a sustained, spreading blaze on the water's surface, especially when projected from a pressurized siphon. It's an ignition source, not the main fuel. Hypothesis C, nitre, potassium nitrate, and oil. The precursor to gunpowder. Nitre contains its own oxidizer, allowing it to burn fiercely even with limited access to atmospheric oxygen. The glitch. While effective, historical accounts suggest a thick, sticky liquid, not a solid powder mixture. And again, nitre is not known to be fueled by water. The truth, historians now agree, is likely a complex synergistic compound. It was not one ingredient, but a precise multi-stage reaction combining light petroleum products, resins for adhesion, and crucially, a volatile chemical initiator like quicklime, or perhaps a form of white phosphorus, which ignites spontaneously upon contact with air, a key feature noted in later dubious attempts at recreation. The sheer sophistication required to manufacture, store, and reliably project this substance suggests a level of practical chemistry that challenges our timeline. The battle of hypotheses reveals less about the formula itself and more about the scale of the technological glitch that we are trying to fix. To understand the fire, we must study the gun, the siphon. Historical accounts, particularly the descriptions in the De Administrando Imperio by Emperor Constantine Porphyrogenitus, detail not just the liquid, but the intricate machinery required to project it. We are looking at a closed system utilizing pressure. The siphon, the Greek fire's gun, was a testament to sophisticated pressure and boiler engineering. It was a bronze tube, often shaped like the head of a beast, mounted on the prow of the ship. This suggests the mixture was heated and then forced out under extreme pressure, perhaps using a bellows or even a simple pump system, giving the stream a high velocity and a longer range than a simple catapulted jar. Archaeological evidence is scarce, mainly due to the destruction of the original siphon ships. But reconstructions based on textual descriptions reveal the engineering prowess. The siphon needed a robust boiler or furnace to keep the compound liquid, and the mechanism had to be perfectly sealed. Any leak would have been catastrophic. The very longevity of the siphon system is its own monumental testimony. It reveals an advanced practical chemistry that history refuses to acknowledge. Crucially, the evidence also includes the language of secrecy. The formula was known only as a divine gift, ensuring that no loyal official would dare commit it to parchment. This isn't just a security measure. It's a cultural locking mechanism. 
The moment the lineage of the chemists or fire masters broke, the knowledge was gone forever. There was no backup. This extreme protocol tells us more than the ingredients do. It proves that the Byzantines themselves viewed this not just as a weapon, but as a unique and irreplaceable glitch in their scientific knowledge base. The remnants of the fire are not in a chemical residue, but in the shift of naval doctrine. After witnessing Greek fire, all opposing naval powers adapted, focusing on avoiding direct confrontation or seeking less flammable hull materials. The evidence is the fear it instilled, the fear that changed global strategy. The fire that defined an empire dissipated. Its final mention is in the 13th and 14th centuries, and by the fall of Constantinople in 1453, the secret was already lost. The age of gunpowder had arrived, making the siphon and its unique terror obsolete. We are left with the final, most haunting question of the glitch files. Was the loss of the Greek fire formula an accident of history or a deliberate correction? The accident argument is logical. The collapse of the Byzantine Empire's central authority, the fracturing of knowledge, and the inevitable death of the last person who knew the secret. But the correction argument is more fascinating. Why did no other society ever rediscover this formula, despite the global spread of knowledge following the Renaissance? Was the raw material so rare, or the process so complex that it truly required the unique conditions and chemical insight of the Byzantine workshops? Or does the loss suggest a deeper, protective layer of history, a self-correcting mechanism that erased technology deemed too dangerous, too powerful, or too ahead of its time. Greek fire saved Constantinople, but its legacy is its absence. It remains a historical scar, a point where the scientific progression timeline briefly bent, allowing a technology from the future to appear in the past, before it was violently pulled back. We can reconstruct the warship. We can analyze the politics. But the core chemical identity of the flame remains elusive. The formula is gone. The history is written. But the fire still burns in the minds of those who investigate the glitch.